Stop! Before you consider taking drastic measures to lose weight, like GLP-1 injections, consider Golo. Golo's release is easier than injections and fad diets. No need to jump through insurance hoops. It's simple. You take one release supplement with each meal. Golo's release supplement contains seven natural plants and three key minerals that target body fat and combat the stress of dieting. With Golo, you follow the Golo for Life plan where you'll safely and effectively control sugar cravings and hunger while minimizing muscle loss, allowing you to feel good and inspired to reach your goal weight. With Golo, you get an effective and affordable weight loss solution that's clinically proven. Because controlling glucose, maintaining healthy insulin levels, and saying goodbye to starvation dieting is the secret to lasting weight loss and wellness. Visit Golo.com to get started today. That's Golo.com. Go to Golo.com to join the 5 million people who have switched to Golo as a better way to lose weight. Visit G-O-L-O.com today. Portions of the following program are pre-recorded. Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270, you're tuned to Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Bakken along with Tom Briggle, owner of the Bismarck Bobcats and Showcase Baby. Of course, we are the mm-hmm. home of the Bobcats, home and away. And uh, currently, you guys are away. You're at the Showcase down in the Twin Cities. Yeah, we sure are. The boys are staying up by the Mega Mall. And uh, the Showcase is always, you know, it's a huge event. And it's been going on now, I think, 20 years, give or take. And the interesting part this year is that... Uh, We've actually won two games. Yeah, usually the showcase is the same amount as we've won. <laughs> <laughs> usually the showcase the is kind time, of a... It's just been so bizarre. Lane always wanted to punt on him. <laughs> yeah, what? Well, it's kind of been a little thorn in the side, a little Achilles heel, and uh, uh, Bobcats, for some reason, have just never, from a, a win perspective, produced at the showcase. And why is this year a little bit different? Oh, wait a minute, wait, 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 Tom, 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 uh, Tom, I figured it out. What? You told the boys that if they win at the showcase, you'll go down the water slide at the hotel next to the Mall of America naked, right? Is is that what it was? That would probably <laughs> not be a good incentive in so many ways. But it could it could be entertaining, there's no doubt about that. Hey, um, I got bail money for you if you need it. So it is it is similar to that though. <laughs> Actually today, you know, Today's a day off for for twenty some years or twenty years. We've been playing four games uh, at the showcase, but we finally uh, smartened up a bit um, and we're playing three. So today's an off day for the boys, and they're going to a place called uh, Wally Ball. And I don't know, have you ever heard of Wally Ball? Oh yeah, yeah. So it's kind of interesting that it's basically a combination of bumper cars and lacrosse and. Uh, it's it's pretty cool, so we're pretty pretty excited to have a little fun uh, beyond uh, beyond on the ice. So uh, it's a great trip, and the boys are playing great. And you know, start off the year four and all. There's you know worse situations than that, certainly. Okay, so I want to back up a little bit and talk about uh, Wednesdays and Thursdays games. So both W's. Yep. Give us a little highlight from Wednesday. Well, Wednesday uh, we played Danbury and. Pretty much owned them, honestly. And uh, if you were at, if you would have been at the game or you're watching it, uh, you know, an NATV time of possession kind of concept. Like I think we outshot them 37 to 16. But you know, both goalies uh, stood on their head. You know, their goalie was uh, was tremendous. We easily could have had four or five goals, uh, but he was he was awesome. And then of course, young Weigel was in the net for us. The Bismarck uh, Bismarck native. Uh, that played at Moorhead, and uh, you know, he stood on his head, too. But, uh, you know, it was decent hockey. It was okay hockey. I think both teams are nervous. Uh, but we came out with a W on Wednesday, and uh, I think that's the first first game win we may have had in the history of the world. So that felt good, and then we built on it on Thursday, of course. All right, Thursday, run us through that game. Mm-hmm. So last night... Uh, for those that had a chance to watch it, like it was a tremendous hockey game. It was fast. Uh, we came out with our guns blazing, and uh, they actually scored first, though, which was kind of kind of cool in a way because we actually I don't think we've been down in a game yet this year, so it's always good to learn to win in different ways over the course of the season, like we've talked about. Uh, but we were blazing, and we are we are fast and uh, move the puck really well. But they scored. Uh, we fought back 
and scored a couple, so it was 2-1 uh, forever. And I think we killed eight penalties in the second period just fighting, you know, tooth and claw to hold on to that lead. Uh, and then the third was even strength. And, again, it was a fast game. They were a really good team. Yeah, the best team we've played for sure. And so um, it was exciting to watch. It, it's as good a game, you know, as I've seen in really quite some time. It was so fast and both teams are so good. We get the empty netter to uh, seal the deal, and uh, next thing you know, we're at Chipotle. It was a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so give us a little rundown, because this time of the year, you mentioned the penalty kill and uh, mm-hmm. the eight penalties you guys killed off. That's usually mm-hmm. not the case this early in the season. It takes a while for those special teams to gel. It seems like the Bobcats are right in stride with I won't say where they need to be because there's always improvement at this time of the year. Yeah. But the special teams for the Bobcats look really good. Uh, there's something a little different. They're they're a cohesive unit no matter which special team they are. And and that doesn't happen this time of the year. Yeah, I think that uh, some of that can be attributed to the fact that we're this year an older team. I think that we have uh, maybe 10 10 or 12 players back, maybe 10, but we also were an older team. Like we've built, uh, you know, a team in our division that we anticipate being successful. Time will tell how successful, but we're a little bit older team. We've brought in, uh, I think, about three or four other 2004s. So we might have 14 or 15 2004s, which for fans, that means it's their last year in junior hockey. So there's a lot of experience. He was brought in a young boy two weeks ago. He's a 2004. He's a leader guy he's from California. He's played in the WHL, and he's just been a real uh, treat to have. And so on the penalty kill side, Steve, we've uh, we've been really good, uh, but we're not where we need to be on power plays. And I think some of that's been hot goaltending, but I think we're at 6 or 8% on power plays right now. And we have a ton of skill. We just got to we got to figure it out, um, you know, how to beat these goalies. And uh, and we will. Uh, we're not concerned about it. But we're up a little bit slower on the power play, but the penalty kill we've been right out. Okay, so now let's get a little highlight of the next game. Uh, what are you looking mm-hmm. at on Saturday? Because you got a day off. And I'm, I'm not going to ask you to highlight uh, uh, the Wally Ball, so we'll, we'll go to the next <laughs> hockey game. <laughs> Yeah, we'll talk about volleyball next year, whatever the heck it's called. I, it, that might not be the right name, but it's going to be fun. Uh, so, third game we play against um, against Janesville, and they've been, uh, uh, I think they're 500 maybe. Uh, I think that, you know, we're a stronger team, and we play about 2 o'clock on Saturday, and maybe 2.30 I think it is. And, um, you know, we're expecting to win. Our goaltending's been solid. Our defense, not really, uh, you know, Popping up the puck, which happens a lot of times, like I said, early in the season. And um, and we really like our forward group. So, um, excited. We should, I should highlight a little bit Mr. Uh, Charlie Big, Little Charlie Big. So, I shouldn't say little because he's about 6'3". Um, but he played last night and played a good game. He's young. He's an 07, as you know, and, and still in high school. But Last weekend, you may know, but he dressed for the U.S. National Development Team and he'll play pretty well. And, you know, he'll play with us this year, but I think the prospects in his future are, are really bright. And so it's nice, you know, we always talk about, well, do you have local kids? Well, we only take them when they, we only take them when they're great. And, uh, and Charlie's got off to a great start as is his brother, Max little pedigree here in uh, the Bismarck area, so looking forward to that. Uh, okay, big game coming up on Saturday with the showcase. Uh, you're going to come out of the showcase with a winning record. The, that's established now, so let's get mm-hmm. back home because you've got a home opener coming up next week. Game one against the Minnesota Mallards. Yeah, new new team, and they've actually uh, actually playing pretty well. And they're, they're from Forest Lake, Minnesota is where they're based, and so there's a lot of high-end talent, a lot of Minnesota kids on there. And, and of course, this year we can have up to eight imports. So the whole league has uh, got a lot of imports, which means skill and um, you know, intensity that way, too. So it's going to be pretty exciting. I'm, I'm hoping that we come into it 5-0. and And I think the fans are, 
are really in for a treat in uh, watching our boys play and how they how fast they are, but also we're, we're pretty big, too. Uh, we feel like we have uh, most of the pieces to, to start off here strong, and then as the year goes on, uh, you know, continue to get better with you know, the coaching staff that we have. And always, uh, BismarckBobcats.com, the place to go for ticket packages. you got some great, great packages lined up this year, a lot of great home games, a lot of great rivalries, and a lot of great hockey. I mean, it's lining up to be another great season right here for the Bobcats. Yeah, I think it's going to be great. And, of course, on Friday night, we'll have Coors Light Bogo beers. Uh, kind of get uh, the season kicked off the right way and only the way a North Dakota would do it with a little Coors Light. <laughs> so it's going to be... Uh, it's going to be fun, and we've got a few uh, surprises in the entertainment package too. That uh, we love hockey, but we love fun too. So it's going to be a, it's going to be a terrific season, really. No water slides. I know that's in the forecast for this season for the Bobcats, so we're looking forward to that as well. Tom Briggle, owner of the Bismarck Bobcats, best of luck with the volleyball and best of luck on Saturday at the showcase. Looking forward to getting the Bobcats home next weekend. Thanks, Steve. Let's go. Tom Briggle, owner of the Bismarck Bobcats. This is the home of the Bobcats, home and away Saturday day game right here on Super Talk 1270. Sir, Super Talk. What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270, you're tuned to Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Bach, and joining us on the program, one of the best of the best. I, I've talked to a lot of businesses that are best of the best. And, you know, Lori Hintz from Beck News, best of the best. Beck News, back at the best of the best. Uh, another one, Two Bets Moving and Storage. Uh, you guys, best of the best. Uh, Brady Wolf joining us. Congratulations, my friend. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so, you and I talking a lot, a lot of other things because we got uh, some other things going on as well, but I want to talk about your business a little bit. And, and you've... Uh, really gone through a big expansion. So uh, before we get into some of that and a little event you've got coming up, talk a little bit about where Two Vets started. Uh, Two Vets actually started, uh, what, 2016 year. Um, I was in the process of getting a moving company up and running with no name. And uh, one of the gentlemen I was serving with actually was getting out and said, hey, I'm coming to North Dakota. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing yet, but I'm coming up there in North Dakota. I said, okay. And uh, I said, well, I'm getting a moving company going. You want to get on board with that? And he said, yep. Perfect. There it was. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I tell people this all the time. The military, basically, if you think of, that, of what a mil- military operation is, and you break it down to its core, they're a logistics company. The military is about moving men and materials and supplies. They're a logistics company. So moving into the moving business perfect fit yeah it's you're, you're absolutely correct it's basically logistics you know getting getting this amount of people this amount of equipment from a to b and by this time um <laughs> that's basically what in a nutshell everybody's doing it in the military so i kind of worked out um you know it's been a it's been a long uh long journey here coming up on just passing seven years um going strong we got a lot of we got a, a lot of new things coming up coming down the pipeline here that we're working on. So just keeping the battle going. So you get a new facility. Um, yes. That was a big step, getting that up and running and off the ground. And uh, uh, you've got a great customer base. You've expanded your area of service. Mm-hmm. And uh, you want to say thank you. So you've got a little event coming up uh, October 3rd uh, yep. up at Two Vets. Uh, where are you located at now? Where's the, the new home office? So we're out at, the address is 5124 Midwest Drive. Um, 
if you head east of Bismarck on Highway 10 there, you go to about a mile and a half. You'll come down the hill. you got 52nd Street that runs north and south. You'll head south on 52nd Street and go up over the hill. It's about a quarter mile, and we're on the right. Perfect. Yep. And uh, that facility, because I know you and I talked, and you languish for a long time finding the right location because you had other plans out there, and that's part of kind of saying, hey, public, welcome, we're here, mm -hmm. and we've got other things to offer now. Yeah, we uh, kind of customer appreciation day. We've been talking about planning for a couple of years here, but um, we've just got some exciting news coming up. A lot of stuff going on right now, so we figured, you know, let's get it, let's get a p little party going on out here where you know our customers can come out and have some fun things to do. For, you know, with the kids, we've got brats, hot dogs, chips going on out there. That's free. We've got uh, some bounce houses that are going to be out there for the kids. We've got a gal coming that's going to be doing face painting for the kids. Um, give a chance for people to come out and, you know, enjoy some fun free on us. Um, we've got a few sponsors that are coming out there, um, to help with that. Starian Bank, Easy Peasy Rentals, um, Scratch from the Bismarck Bobcats is going to be out there. Andy's Armadillo from Texas Roadhouse is going to be out there so the kids can meet them. Um, but it kind of coincides with, um, you know, we've been looking for, for a lot of years to find a place. We finally found this place that had room to grow. And that's kind of coming full circle now. We have our storage unit project that's been in the works for two years now. Is finally, the buildings are finally going up. So um, that'll be closing down here in the next two months or so. And we'll have storage units ready to go. A lot going on yep. with uh, two vets. And uh, once again, when's the open house and the customer appreciation? So the party is October 3rd, um, 4 to 7 out at our building. That's a Thursday. So make sure you stop on out, uh, say thanks to Two Bets. I do have to ask you a question, though. It's, you know, you've expanded your area around mm. outside of North Dakota to a certain degree uh, around the region. Um, so uh, the one question I always ask small business is workforce. I mean, do you run into workforce issues or how, how are you managing some of those constraints? Um, we, we really don't. We really haven't seen too many issues with that. I mean, it comes and goes. Obviously, there's times just like everybody where, you know, everybody's shorthanded but uh, we've got a really good team right now um we, we, we usually do around i mean in general all the time we have a really great team uh, from top to bottom we got a great team you guys i mean that's that's why we got voted best of the best you know it's it's because the team we have the guys that are out there daily the people answering the phones doing the customer service um all around everybody's just on the same page that you know to perform perform our duties to a certain level and um make sure the customer leaves happy at the end of the day with what they paid for so when i talk to a lot of small businesses and the ones that don't have the workforce issues the ones that are not having some of those constraints um they're good employers they're they're good companies to work for and they take care of their employees so uh two vets uh once again customer appreciation open house october 3rd four to seven what's the location again the location we are at 5124 midwest drive bismarck Make sure you stop on out. Brady, thanks for coming in this morning. Yep, thanks, Steve. Uh, this is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. News Talk. This October, Tanger invites you to shop pink and save lives. Your donation of $10 or more to the Breast Cancer Research Foundation helps fuel innovative research that brings us closer to a cure. It also unlocks exclusive savings from brands like Coach, Crocs, Columbia Factory Store, and more to shop all month long. Join us as we mark 30 years of advancing research and empowering hope. Donate and access your exclusive savings today at tanker.com. This is Mark Mandan, Super Talk 1270. Welcome back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270, you're tuned to Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Bakken, and uh, we've got an election coming up. Uh, some of the elections uh, a lot of people may not be aware of are there some judgeships that are available out there, including uh, a district judgeship. And Jason Hammes joining us in the studio this morning. Uh, he is a candidate. Uh, Jason, introduce yourself. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Jason Hammes. I am running for the open position would be open due to Judge Romanek's retirement for the South Central Judicial District. It's a district judgeship. Um, currently, I'm working in the district as a judicial referee and magistrate. Um, this would be 
a different judicial posi uh, position, uh, elected one rather than appointed. Okay, so Judge Romanic, uh, friend of the show, big in the community, big shoes to fill, so uh, it, it's kind of a big position. Um, why? Uh, what piqued your interest on becoming a judge? Uh, I've honestly kind of aimed at that since I began out of law school. My first job was a, a law clerk in Minnesota for a judge who be eventually became an um, appellate judge in Minnesota. Um, so you work as a law clerk kind of as their own staff attorney. You write the opinions, you're in the court hearings. Um, you come out of law school and you really don't know what you're going to do. It's kind A lot of, uh, of different places to go from law school. It's correct. It's like uh, constitutional, business, correct. financial, family, defense, uh, prosecuting. So many different avenues to go with law. I, I came out thinking I only wanted to do civil law. I didn't want to be in the courtroom. I had no interest in criminal law. I took the classes. Um, after working in the courtroom, I found out that I loved being in the courtroom. I, I like being in the argument, being in the moment, making the quick decisions and being right in the courtroom. Um, so I quickly switched to then wanting to be a prosecutor because there's no one in the courtroom more than in criminal um, law. Uh, so from that position, I went back from Minnesota, back into North Dakota, and I took a job as a Burley County um, Assistant State's Attorney as a prosecutor. And I worked at Burley County Prosecution for about, uh, I think around three years, and then switched over to the city of Bismarck, doing most of the prosecution for the city of Bismarck for an additional seven, I believe. So it was just under, um, just under 10 years, about nine years, I was a prosecutor in Burley, uh, Burley County City of Bismarck. You know, it's funny, uh, probably about 90% of all attorneys that I talk to, and I've got a lot of friends that are attorneys, and they never wind up where they thought they were going to start when they went into law school. They always wind up changing. Um, your current role, so you're a magistrate and a judicial referee, and I want to talk about that a little bit because those are things that people don't know are part of the court system or part of the judicial process. So the magistrate side. Explain to that to our listeners what that role is. They're, they're both kind of a, a weird blob of things. So they were enacted, I think, judicial referee came about working with mostly juvenile court in the, I think, late 70s, early 80s. Magistrate came into Because they overlap a lot, don't they? Correct. So they're kind of, you get both titles because under the statutes, each title allows you to hear different cases. Um, but really... Um, they, they they work together. So the, the judicial referee magistrate allows me to do all of the case types under both of those designations. Um, magistrates, again, were more focused on some cr criminal aspects, some, I think, probate, if I recall correctly, um, temporary emergency protection orders. The ju judicial referee side gives me jurisdiction over all juvenile proceedings, which includes, um, you know, kids being bad, so delinquencies, uh, parents not being the best child in need of protections, termination of parental rights cases. Um, those are all under that juvenile scope. Uh, protection orders, again, are some of the referees. Uh, divorces, I can do any type of divorce that's not a contested divorce. So I can work with custody orders of protection for not paying child support. Uh, divorces that are contested under a certain amount, I think it's $75,000. I can handle those type of cases, so family law. Um, you got to wear a lot of hats. Yes, uh, small claims, traffic cases, uh, uh, hearings for mental health petitions. And a mental health petition would be if someone was, uh, a family member was worried about them uh, for you know, suicidal self-harm reasons or if they were just having um, some other mental health issues, that's an emergency petition where then they're taken in, not custody, but placed under a, a secured setting in a mental health hospital. So those type of cases... Um, there's a couple other ones, uh, areas that I'm able to cover. And, and like you said, it's a lot of hats. It's a lot of things to do on a daily basis. Okay. One of the things I want to talk about is how busy you are, because I don't think people realize, and, and just full disclosure, I had the uh, privilege of working with Jason when I was mayor of Bismarck and he was working in our city attorney's office. So I got to know you a little bit over there and people don't realize how busy the judicial system is in the city of Bismarck and in our community as a whole, you know, Bismarck, Mandan, Burley, Morton, and there's a lot going on. So talk a little bit about what your typical day would look like. Cause I know you're constantly kind of at the beck and call of the judge going, Hey, we got a, something that's a little critical time wise. You got to get here. 
I think that's the biggest role right now for referees, magistrates. Um, those positions are only in, there's one in Minot, two in two referee magistrate positions in Bismarck, two in Fargo, the, the bigger districts due to the caseload, really. Um, and all those cases I described are district court cases that a district judge would hear otherwise in another jurisdiction. So they're all district court cases. They're not like a lower level case, but they're all assigned to referees so we can do those emergency quicker hearings uh, and they don't kind of come up the district judge's calendar. So as, as a typical day, a lot of those are confidential. So without getting into them too much, um, today is an example. I start at 8.30 with an emergency hearing. Um, it's a juvenile emergency hearing. I have hearings scheduled every half hour today until noon. And then I come back in at 1.15 in another uh, emergency hearing, and I have hearings until 4.30, I think, today. So it's a constant, every half hour I have a hearing set. And that's the other thing with these hearings is um, they're all generally potentially contested. They take a lot of time. Um, they can't be heard in you know, a five-minute period. There has to be enough time to give parties t- an opportunity to be heard, an opportunity to contest you know, what the other side is trying to do. They're not just uh, hearings where you're kind of brought in like a bond hearing, bail hearing that are quick and you're running through 30 and a half hour. They're all contested. They generally have attorneys on both sides or the potential in every case to have an attorney on both sides. Um, and they take time and they have to happen quickly. A lot of the referee cases are emergency type within 14 days, you know, evictions I handle. Those have to be held within a certain time frame. They're, they're more the shorter time frame, quicker cases where district court cases generally, unfortunately, um, extend, you know, a criminal case can take a year or more civil cases, more than a year family cases, a long period of time. These are much more quicker. All of them have very short time frames and have to be done quickly. Well, and what really <clears throat> adds the workload is, you know, there's constantly new cases popping up. And if you're dealing with a juvenile case or a custody case or a mental health case, that needs your attention right away. So that adds to the workload. So um, magistrate, judicial referee, uh, very busy in the community. So last couple of minutes, uh, I want to give you an opportunity pitch. Why are you, because I, I look at the resume and I go, I know what personally what you've been doing and i know how that's good training to be a judge i think that's one of the big aspects is is why i think i'm the most qualified candidate is i have the experience so i'm the only candidate with judicial experience i've been doing this position for five years now so i've been a magistrate judicial referee for five years in that time frame i've heard over eight thousand individual hearings um, and those hearings include trials, um, which is also important that I don't, these hearings, although they're expedited, they have the same rules as district level cases. So my, my delinquency cases are beyond a reasonable doubt. All the rules of evidence apply the same as, as an adult criminal case. In my civil cases, the same rules apply as, as in any other civil case. Um, I'm applying the same rules now that any district judge would, would apply in any case that they handle. Um, and during those those hearings, I also have obviously full contested trials as well. I've had a week long trial, um, and, and I think that that really prepares you. It prepares you not only to understand and, and handle a judicial caseload, but it prepares you to make decisions. That's the 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 biggest jump from going to an attorney to behind the bench is even small decisions are, are hard. Um, it's it's easy to think that you can sit and make decisions, but it's much harder to do. Um, I've, I've stated that there'd be no decision that I can think of that would be harder to make as a judge than termination of parental rights. Um, people have asked me if, if it would be hard to to send someone to prison, you know, or 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 do a large monetary lawsuit against someone. And I've stated, I've replied that there's there's nothing harder that I can think of having kids of my own than to terminate someone's parental rights against their wishes, so a contested termination um, due to you know, their behavior, I suppose, in the past, but I, those are decisions that I make now in my position. So I, I think and, that, that prepares you. And, and that's kind of something you have to look at because a lot of criminal cases and stuff, the facts will bear themselves out where you're dealing with a lot of gray area and emotion. And, uh, you know, <laughs> that's always what's first and foremost, what's in the best interest of the child. And maybe that is not 
continuing that parental so uh, that hard decisions you're right I, I couldn't think of anything harder uh jason best of luck uh as far as if anybody wants more information find out more about you uh website where do they go it's uh, hammersfordjudge.com is the website. You can find me on Facebook, uh, Jason Hammersford, South Central Judicial District Judge. Um, I'm, I'm trying to be active on there. I answer questions on, on either platform. And I, I look forward to hearing from the community and hopefully um, have their vote come November. Jason, thanks for coming in this morning. Thank you. A little bit of uh, information on what a magistrate or judicial referee does as well this morning. So this is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk. The Humana Honor Medicare Advantage Plan gives you $1,680 back each year in your Social Security check. Choose coverage that helps you keep more money in your pocket. Learn more at GetHumana.com. Humana, a more human way to health care. The Part B Give Back Benefit pays part or all of your Part B premium, and the amount may change based on the amount you pay for Part B. Limitations and restrictions may apply. Humana is a Medicare Advantage HMO and PPO organization with a Medicare contract. Enrollment in any Humana plan depends on contract renewal. Yeah. Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270, you're tuned to Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Bach, along with Stacey Schaefer from the 318 Project. And uh, 318 Project, of course, works with the trafficking space, whether it's human trafficking for sex industry workers or labor trafficking or, you know, sextortion is a thing now that's mm-hmm. growing and growing and growing. Um, when you're looking at how to fix or mitigate, I, I fix is probably too strong of a word, unfortunately. Right. But when you're looking at mitigating some of these issues, it comes down to education mm-hmm. and building a network of support and those that are diligent at the wall. So mm-hmm. that starts with law enforcement, first responders, teachers, Mm -hmm. you know, anybody in the community, keep keep your eyes open, right? Yeah. A third of cases are reported by the general public. So again, if you don't think, you know, well, I'm not a teacher, I'm not a a police officer that this doesn't impact me, it absolutely does because we all have a role to play. It's just simply being aware of our surroundings, whether we're traveling, if you're frequently in hotels, airports, noticing behavior that seems out of place. It's those simple things that can make a difference or you're shopping at Walmart, Target, and again, noticing something out of place. I'm not saying it's always human trafficking, but there's probably something there and if your gut is telling you there's something there, report that. As far as sextortion goes, if your kid, your niece, your nephew, your grandchild shares with you, hey, this person is talking to me this way, I, I, I don't know what to respond, what to do, report that to law enforcement. I can tell you within our Bismarck Mandan community, they're taking it real seriously and they're looking through these kids' phones and trying to track where this information is coming from. So don't just brush it under the rug and think, oh, it's not a big deal. No, we don't know what type of criminal enterprise is behind this. It's worth it to make that call. So when you're looking at the education piece, and I can see a lot of different areas that need to be educated, Mm -hmm. the general public. For sure. You know, Mm -hmm. what to be looking for when you're out in public or when you're at home and somebody moved in next door and there's some strange things going on there. That's one. Yeah. The educational system, which gets a lot of exposure to children. Mm -hmm. um, That's another that five years ago, they weren't looking for what they're looking for today. No, for sure not. And you have to think the average age, a study just came out that said that kids are using technology technology devices at around 18 months. Wow. So just think about that. If we are giving a child that's 18 months old some type of electronic device and we're not explaining how to use this device, what Well, at 18 happen? months, how does it... There's nothing to explain. Right. They'll and, figure and, it and out, but, but how do you explain something to them? Yes, yep. And so I, I think we have to ask ourselves those questions too, is how on that side, but then from that educational standpoint, having these conversations within a school setting of what our kids are dealing with. And that's something we, uh, you know, we are always happy to do is to go into the schools. And usually what we do is 
in, in smaller communities, we will give a community presentation as well as work with the school. Um, that might take us two days to get through all of that, but we'll do that because we know the importance of educating the community, especially after you've educated the children in the community so everyone's on the same page. So now you all have the same information at the same time. And that's where the community partnerships come in because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of communities or school districts or, you know, they don't have the resources for Absolutely. that. And that's where uh, 31 Aid Project can come in and help. Uh, the other part of the education piece is the first responders, the law enforcement, because, mm -hmm. I, you know, somebody's busy and they're dealing with four car accidents when you call 911 yeah. and it's it's hard. Mm -hmm. It, is that a priority? Well, it's getting to be a priority, yep. but that's part of the education that law enforcement or the first responders or mm -hmm. the EMS system is really beginning to take serious, and that's because of the education. Yes, because it's also recognizing with what you were saying, with human trafficking, it's not uncommon to see drug trafficking in that as well. And so you again, a lot of overlap. Yep. There's a lot of intersections here. Yes. So what we're realizing is when we go into a potential crime scene or crime scenario involving this, there's probably going to be more than one crime present. So it might just not be the human trafficking. You're probably going to have something drug trafficking related. Same with the labor side of things is we're learning to look for all the different crimes that are present that we maybe didn't realize were present before. So it's just reevaluating these cases. So we're just relooking at it versus what we how we used to look at it. Again, great resource, your website. Mm -hmm. how yes. Do people... It's 318project.org. Okay. One of the things that comes into play here is where do you find the resources to get these out? And yes. uh, you guys have a fundraiser coming up that's mm -hmm. actually kind of fun. Yes. You know, it, it, this is a very dark subject, and, and yes. I do apologize, but you know, sometimes you have to pull things out of the darkness, pull them out of the mm -hmm. closet, talk about them so that they get better. Yeah. Um, so now we're going to lighten it up a little bit because you yes. got a fun little party coming up. Yes, yes. Thank you for pointing that out because it's um, our second annual Harvest Moon Soiree and it's October 12th. And although it will be educational, it will also be fun because we know that with these heavy topics, we also have to celebrate the successes that are happening as well. And so this is going to be an evening. It starts at 5.30 p.m. at 1603 Main Events in Bismarck. And we will have a DJ, we will have different games, but we'll also hear directly from survivors. And I think it's important because our work, it, it it's all dependent on them and what they tell us and making sure we're going in the right direction but also well, as a charity you're yeah. outcome based yes yes we have to make sure we're doing things right and hearing from the survivors you'll get to see what does this really look like and how has it impacted them but because of the support from the community where are they at today and those are all things that people will hear at this event and once again, uh, tickets, uh, you do have a deadline for getting tickets because yes. tables are going fast. Yes, we only have about five tickets, or sorry, five tables left and around 15 general admission tickets. So definitely get your tickets um, purchased ASAP. And by September 27th, that's when we have to have our numbers in to 1603 main events. So you have about two weeks to secure your spot. Stacy, thank you so much for the work that you do, uh, not only in our community, but across the state and around the region and across the country and across mm -hmm. other lines as well. So um, mm -hmm. really a, a story that doesn't get told enough, but it's out there. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to change it, going to fix it, going to make an impact, mm -hmm. um, we need people like you and the 318 Project to lead the way. Yeah. Well, thank you. And thanks for having us on the show. Uh, one more time, website for not only tickets, but other resources. Yes, 318project.org. Stacy Schaefer with the 318 Project. This is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Talk of the Town, weekday morning starting at 9 on Super Talk 1270 and the free Super Talk 1270 mobile app.
concern. Most tax pros leave a message. It's Jane. I'm moving on to a TurboTax expert who beat your price. Adam Devine, tell him how I feel. Hey, tax pro, she's been thinking twice. Just believe TurboTax will beat your price. This is a tax break. Uh! Switch to a TurboTax live expert and we'll beat what you paid your pro last tax season. Make the switch at TurboTax.com slash beat your price. TurboTax full service only. Sign up by 12-20-2024 and file by 4-1-2025. Full details at TurboTax.com slash beat your price. Without apology, the regular Joe show with Joe Giganti. Weekday evenings at 9 on Super Talk 1270 and the free Super Talk 1270 mobile app. Portions of the following program are pre recorded. Welcome back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270, you're tuned to Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Bakken and joining from the studio, Deidre from Bismarck Transit, also Mike Conley, the commissioner for the city of Bismarck. Uh, Mike, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, something that's going to be on the ballot coming up here. Well, actually, as ballots are starting to be out uh, a little sooner than later. And, uh, Deidre, thanks for coming in again. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Uh, so, a little rundown where we're at with transit, because it's kind of a... It, it's always a question of what's going on with Bisman Transit. People look at the buses, they don't see high ridership. Uh, There's a need in the community. The funding, I don't think people always understand how the operational costs are divvied out. There's federal dollars involved. So we're going to take a little pause, back up a little bit, and kind of an overview. How does Bismarck Transit, uh, Bismarck Transit work for the consumers in the community? So uh, right now, we've actually had a extreme jump in ridership, especially for our capital area transit, the cat bus, the public bus, the larger ones that you see around town. Um, so in August, we had over uh, 11,500 trips. Um, so that's the highest that we've had since 2017, 2016. It's been a long time. Yeah. Been, a, been a very long time. So I know one, one common misconception is um, people see the buses and they see that no one's in them. You're seeing a snapshot in time whether they're passing you on the road or, you know, they're pulled over letting someone off or someone's boarding. Um, you see that one little little drop in time. But when you're looking at the picture of 12 hours a day, you know, every single day, minus minus Sundays, um, we're actually performing better than we had been in almost a decade. Um, on the flip side, our paratransit service, we're at about 7,500, 8,000 trips um, per month. So that's a, that's a good number for us to be at. Um, but one thing that's been a pain point for us since really the pandemic was um, staffing with our, with our drivers. You know, if we don't have staffing for our bus drivers, the consumer is impacted because now we're having longer wait times. We're having to deny trips because we just don't have the capacity. Um, we're now at a position where we've actually jumped up the number of drivers that we've had, which unfortunately does cost me more money. Um, but that means that we're able to really make sure that each one of the riders who's calling in to schedule a ride, you know, whether that's two weeks in advance, which they can schedule up to two weeks in advance, or the day before, we're able to actually perform that trip now. Well, and that was a thing that, you know, I'm going to put on my former mayor hat for a minute, and that was a conversation that we had quite often at the table was, you know, where the quality of life for the paratransit riders fit into that equation because for me that was that that's the job uh, everything else is beyond that but i don't think people always understand that they have to work together because without one you really don't have the service with the other so it's kind of a balancing act yeah absolutely so um when we first had transit here uh back in the early 90s we never had the fixed route service um, it was only a service for the elderly and disabled. So that really set the tone for um, what public transportation was in our community. Um, we had a lot of individuals who maybe were were using the system more as a taxi service than really a, um, a shared ride system. Um, fast forward to 2017 when we did a, a major revamp of the system and ended up having to do some service cuts just for budgetary reasons. Um, that That shifted a little bit where we were maybe a little bit stricter on how um, people were qualified for riding the bus. Obviously, that that <laughs> took a little bit of um, time for everyone to get used to. Um, but realistically, the whole goal of that was to balance out the service for the general public as well as the service for the elderly and disabled. Um, our funding is is directly tied, like you mentioned, directly tied to both services. We don't have the ability to have one without the other. Um, so 
eliminating the the fixed route service in theory, you know, if we have budgetary issues, sounds like a great idea. But we lose our major federal grant if we would do that. And that's over $2 million a year. (laughs) So eliminating that that fixed route service is really out, out of the question, you know, when we're talking budgetary things like that. And then when you look at at doing service changes for the for the paratransit, um, now we're not actually performing the service that the community needs if we're talking major service reductions just to align with the hours of what our fixed route service is. So again, it's kind of a juggling act of oh. you don't want to provide too much service in one area so that you can uh, because that affects providing the service on the other side, which is the paratransit side, which that is a quality of life issue. And, and you know, Commissioner Conley, uh, with this being part of your portfolio and you being in the healthcare world, you see this firsthand on the impacts that paratransit uh, ridership has to deal with. Absolutely. Well, I'm a traveler in the medical field, and one of the things going from facility to facility is that facilities will oftentimes have a bus in order to get their grandmas and grandpas to medical treatment um, or um, mental health treatment uh, appointments. But if uh, grandma or grandpa wants to stay connected to the family through like weddings or graduations or funerals, um, if the family cannot provide the ride, then those folks end up isolated and disconnected. Um, And that's where a public transportation system comes into place is they can accommodate those rides. As well as there's a significant amount of people, our grandmas and grandpas, that remain independent in their homes because they have access. They've gone beyond the point to where they can drive. We don't want them driving. And that keeps their retirements and their dollars in the community locally, where if they go into a nursing care facility, a lot of that money gets paid to D.C. and we see it a couple of years later. So there's a direct benefit. If they even have the ability to remain local. I have talked to more people, and you probably have a little bit more insight on this. Uh, I've talked to more people in the healthcare where they're having difficulties finding facilities to take in their parents, grandparents, and um, people with maybe a little bit of a different type of care, the facilities just aren't out there because they have uh, uh, a crisis in workers as well. Absolutely, and that's where some of the push is going towards more home health care options through our alternative dwelling units, our alternative dwelling spaces. So we can create these things to keep our families connected, but it's a matter of creating the conversation, making sure the dollars are there so we can move forward in the right way as a community. And there's so many things that come back to transit, transportation. Uh, it is such a huge component of a lot of different facets. We're going to get into that a little bit more. Uh, we're talking with Deidre from Bismarck Transit, Mike Conley, uh, Bismarck City Commissioner. This is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270. Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270, you're tuned to Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Bach, along with Deidre from Bismarck Transit, Mike Conley, Bismarck City Commissioner. Uh, we're talking about transportation needs right now. I want to shift a little bit because um, we mentioned in transportation, you know, connectivity, whether it's on the paratransit side, uh, for just continuing a quality of life, having the same opportunities that those without a disability have, or the working perspective with public transit. And I kind of want to separate those two a little bit and talk to you, Deidre, about why it's important for a community to have a public transit system and and knowing that without one, you really struggle with the other. But uh, let's start with the public transit side. Why is that important for the Bisman community? Absolutely. Um, so when we're talking public transit, we're talking the city bus, um, the larger capital Cat area, bus, yeah. Cat bus, capital area transit. Okay, question everybody asked, yep. because I <laughs> asked this too when I was mayor. Why can't we have smaller buses to meet the ridership that we see on the buses? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this comes up quite a bit. You're not the only person I who know, have asked me I this know. question. Um, so the way that the federal grants are are fashioned, um, we have actually 85% of every capital purchase for our rolling stock is covered by a federal grant. So we're only covering 15% of that. However, the FTA, which is the Federal Transit Administration, has guidelines and restrictions on 
the useful life of each one of our vehicles. So our smaller vehicles, the, the paratransit buses, the, the white buses you see driving around, that's about five to seven years. Whereas our larger vehicles, the useful life can be up to 12, 14 years. So when you're looking at your initial investment, we're paying about $470,000 for those larger buses. But again, keep in mind, I'm only paying 15% of that. So about $70,000 for one of those larger buses. I have that one-time investment, and then I have that bus for 12, 14 years. Whereas those smaller buses, I'm paying about $160,000, and I'm buying that bus to three times over than what I would a larger bus. Again, those larger buses are also built for the stop um, flag down system. So, you know, they have the ramp where individuals are able to, you know, board and, and disembark without having the driver, you know, get out of their seat and let down the lift like you would need to with our paratransit vehicles. So that keeps the bus running on schedule. Those vehicles are really specifically built for a public transit flag down system. When you talk about our paratransit, those buses are not built for stop and go traffic. They are not built to, you know, have have people boarding, you know, every five, ten minutes, you know, when we're pulling over to the side of the road. They're also not built to have the number of miles put on them. Useful life of those buses is about 150,000, 200,000 miles. Whereas, you know, I've had a bus, um, a capital area transit bus that we have had... I think it was over 600,000 miles on it before we finally decommissioned it. It had celebrated its 18th birthday, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so so the initial investment and the long-term use really is a major component that we consider when we're purchasing vehicles of that size. And not to mention, you know, you think someone's bringing a cart of groceries or a stroller or things of that nature. You know, they stop at Walmart. It's a lot more challenging to have maybe a couple of those individuals on a paratransit vehicle than if you have the larger city bus where you have a lot more space for people to spread out. And then during our peak times, we are seeing, you know, 10 to 15 people on that bus and the capacity is much different. The other question comes up and a lot of the reason they're tied together is because people think of, well, this big bus, it's it's got to have more fuel costs and more. Explain that for our listeners this morning. Yeah, so that's an analysis that we've done multiple times, and we actually have to do that for for our grants. So it's fact-checked by several government agencies. Um, we're looking at about the exact same uh, miles per gallon or fuel usage um, on our fixed bu- route buses as well as our paratransit. So it's about seven miles a gallon. Only difference is the larger buses are diesel, the smaller buses are, are gasoline. But it's it's pretty much the exact same fuel consumption, <laughs> which is surprising, I know. Um, but but unfortunately, yeah, we're about in that seven miles per gallon range. Okay, so coming back, why is it important to have a public transit system for a growing community like Bismarck Command and, and Lincoln? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one component that I think a lot of people don't really consider is when we're talking economic growth in the area and, and possibly having companies come into the area, one thing that they look at is there a public transit system that they can use to promote um, workers throughout the area? So, so think of like a Bobcat or, or a larger company. If they're looking for a new headquarters or a new place to develop, they're not going to consider a location. or a Cloverdale's com- a great example. Cloverdale's a wonderful um, example. <laughs> University of Mary is another great mm-hmm. example because a lot of those students may not have vehicles. Yep. It, it, it's kind of a weird little nuance. But, you know, when, when I was mayor, we had that conversation mm-hmm. about, okay, how do we keep that route going? Yeah, absolutely. And and we work very closely with both, both Cloverdale and the University of Mary to um, do travel trainings. We go out on site. We have them come to the facility. We get them on the bus. So if they're a little apprehensive about using public transit for the first time, um, we kind of hold their hands until they feel a little bit more comfortable. But But that's one component of it is... People or these organizations will not consider communities that don't have access to appropriate public transportation. And I mean, we might be in a little bit of the gray area because our our public transportation is not the most comprehensive. You know, ending at seven o'clock for budgetary reasons, obviously, is not ideal. We're missing a lot of those second shift, third shift workers. But at least we're being able we're able to fill a gap for a portion of what's needed for the transportation. We're getting them to work or we're getting them from work or, you know, maybe the recreational side of things. We're getting them to groceries and, and, you know, all their other errands and things like that. So that's one of the main reasons. So you touched a little bit on the shift work side of stuff, but uh, peak times. Mm -hmm. So what are the peak times when you're looking at public transit? 
So our peak times would be from about 7 to 9 and then 3 a. to... Yep, yeah, a.m., yes. And then about 3 to 5, 30, 6 p.m. So what does the system look like in, well, I'm not going to call it downtime, but a little bit more slack time? So we run the exact same routes um, throughout the entire day. Um, we might just have a lower ridership during that downtime, not to the point where we'd want to suspend it at, at any point, but... Um, but if we're talking like 11 o'clock to 2 o'clock, we might not see 10, 15 people on the bus. You might only see two or three who are, you know, retired and they're going to CVS to get their prescriptions or something like that. Whereas during those more peak times, we're, we're potentially taking children to school. We're taking um, people to their to their places of employment or medical, anything like that. Well, I think one of the misconceptions, too, and, and I might be guilty of this sometimes as well because it would drive me nuts seeing, it's like, wow, look at those buses and nobody's in them. But when are you looking, too? It's like I'm busy when I'm going to work at 7 o'clock in the morning and I'm not paying attention to the buses. Or if I'm running an errand at work and it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it, well, there's not going to be that ridership. So, um perception for a lot of people winds up being reality. Um, we're going to switch over to the paratransit side when we come back from the break. We're talking with Deidre from Bisman Transit, uh, Mike Conley, City Commissioner. This is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Are you struggling to lose weight and keep it off? Tired of wasting time and money on starvation diets that lead to more frustration and stress? If there was a weight loss solution that could actually work for you, would you try it? Then head to golo.com. I'm Steve. I lost 138 pounds in nine months on Golo. I'm Amber. I've lost 128 pounds with Golo. If you're ready to take back control of your life, head to golo.com now and see how Golo can work for you. That's golo.com. My sleep is way better. My inflammation has gone way down. Golo saved my life. I was way overweight. That's what sent me down the path. I wanted to make sure and live for my kid. I have literally tried everything. I was on the verge of getting gastric bypass surgery, and I saw the Golo commercial, and it was the last thing I tried because it worked. Join over 2 million people who found a better way to lose weight with Golo. Your healthier and happier life begins at Golo.com. That's G-O-L-O dot com. Again, G-O-L-O dot com. To talk of the town on Super. Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270, you're tuned to Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Bach, along with Dietrich from Bismarck Transit and Mike Conley, Bismarck City Commissioner. Uh, we're talking about transportation needs within a community, a growing community like the Bismarck, Mandan, Lincoln, Burley, Morton County side of things. Of course, transit works just within the community, um, within city limits and of our communities. But why is it important to have those transportation options within a community? And I want to shift gears now to the paratransit side because this is something where I've got a little bit more passion. And Deidre, you know me. It, it's about making sure that's our responsibility. Mm -hmm. For me, it's that's the responsibility is making sure that the quality of life and the opportunities for paratransit riders are there. And when I was mayor, that was where I looked at the fiscal responsibility for the community and... It's just, that's our job. So talk a little bit about those transportation needs because we have a very robust paratransit ridership. There's some gaps, there's some holes, there's more needs. Um, hours are always a concern, holidays are always a concern, but being able to utilize that community within our community from a job experience and, and across the board, it is vital that we have a robust paratransit system. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about some of those transportation um, needs, gaps, and where things are at right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one thing I do want to touch on is if you're looking at our paratransit service, the hours that we do offer it, um, I, would, I would challenge you to take a moment to compare our system to any other system in the Midwest or even, you know, the upper Midwest, we have one of the most comprehensive, one of the longest running um, paratransit systems of any other um, service provider. So we're starting at 5.30 a.m. We're running until midnight, Monday through Saturday. Sunday, we do have shortened hours, 7.30 to 2.30. But the need is there for those hours of service. You know, we have a very, like you said, a very strong community of the elderly and disabled who need this service. 
Um, unfortunately, this is the service that does cost us more money to provide. And that's where we really get into that major pain point of how are we finding the balance? You know, we know that the need is there. Obviously, we know that that's there. But how are we able to close the gap on funding so we're not having these conversations year after year of, okay, we might be looking at reducing from running to midnight to now we might only have to be able to run till nine. And that's a major concern for the for the consumer because their whole lives revolve around being able to still be members of the community. Connectivity. Exactly. And if we're having this carrot every year and pulling it away from them saying, hey, we just can't figure out the funding situation, it might not be a service that is as comprehensive as you're used to in two years. That just puts extra stress on these individuals' lives. That really doesn't need to be there. And that's obviously one of the reasons why Commissioner Conley and myself have been you know, working on, on some new funding <laughs> components. And if I can interject into that, we have a significant number of people that, because of their abilities, they're filling in the gaps for businesses that Huge are... Huge workforce component. Ha- having trouble finding um, employees. These are dedicated employees. They're actually producing in the community. Well, based on abilities and challenges, they're like superhumans. Or, uh, they have superpowers and respect, uh, respect that they're overcoming a lot, but they can actually provide. If they're isolated at home, we're still paying because if we take their access away, they can't produce. Uh, but through dignity, they deserve a uh, place in our community. And I would rather have them connected and thri- helping our community thrive than being isolated or facing institutionalization just because it changes the dynamic of how our community functions. So that balancing act, and because it comes up all the time, how do we supply the resources needed for the paratransit side? And I don't think there's anybody at the commission table that, uh, or within the community that doesn't agree that there is a greater need there. And you compared how robust our system is to a lot of the other communities. And yes, that's a nice comp, but we can always do a little bit better. So if we're setting the standard, let the other communities come to us and go, how are you doing this? So when you're always trying to reinvent the system, which you are because every year the funding winds up being a little bit of different, how difficult is that having to go, okay, I, I gotta put that creative hat on every single year? Yeah, it's definitely an administrative challenge. It's challenging for our board. Like I said, we've we've beat the dead horse. We've had the conversation over and over again. And there's only so many ways that you can cut the pie. Um, The money is staying the same or, you know, even being reduced in some cases. And the service has to stay the same or, like you said, improve. At some point, obviously, we'd love to talk improvements. It's just so hard to edge into those conversations when we're barely keeping our head above water right now. And, And obviously, it's not for being fiscally irresponsible. I mean, we have a board that is very, very involved. Um, I've been with transit for you know six years now, and I've seen the ebbs and flows of funding and, and, and the direction of the community and things like that. But the biggest issue is the cost is rising for everything and the funding is staying the same. So no matter what we do creatively to try and fix that issue, we just can't rub two pennies together and make more money. <laughs> it doesn't work. So so transit is funded um, partially by the federal government. Um, we have some standard grants that we don't have to apply for. We also do have some competitive grants that we apply for each year to help with our operating expenses and, and obviously our capital purchases like our buses. Um, then we also do have three mills through the city of Bismarck and two mills through the city of Mandan. So that property tax component pays for a portion of the service as well. Uh, a small amount comes from the state of North Dakota. So it's about $470,000 a year that we get from the state of North Dakota. Um, and then that's it. <laughs> you know, so a lot of people think, well, increase fares, fares, fix fares, or uh, add more to the fares. But and, a lot and that's of the people you're dealing out. with are on fixed incomes mm-hmm. or lower incomes. Um, They just don't have those means. I had a lot of conversations with uh, paratransit riders. They're like, we we can't afford this. Mm -hmm. And when other options also went away within the community, that made it even worse. So 
managing that is challenging at best. Um, there is a potential option because if Measure 4 passes, that's going to impact some of transit and what the paratransit side looks like. So we're going to talk about that when we come back uh, with Commissioner Mike Conry and uh, Deidre. This is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Talk of the Town, brought to you by Big Boy. Just get in line. It moves fast. Dakota Pharmacy and Dakota Natural Health Center. We're here to help you stay well. Trademark Realty and Silver Ranch. Talk of the town. I hear it, Gene. I got it. I'm you up bet. against my time. Thanks. Good morning. Market update on the Red River Farm Network. I'm Randy Conan. Grain markets continue to trade mixed here with uh, wheat down slightly, corn up slightly, beans seeing some real decent gains going on here. Heartlandinvest.com uh, CTA Gene Grainer uh, says uh, weather has been the primary driver here. And here we are on a Friday, a harvest Friday. We're going to see good movement again of corn harvesting and bean harvesting this week into the weekend. And there's no harvest pressure. And here we are on the corn up four cents on the day, literally within a penny or two of the best levels of the week the best level is the month of September, and we're heading into a September stocks uh, positioning uh, report on Monday, and the market's not fearful of it. And that's likely because of the yields are not probably panning out that they're expecting throughout the Midwest. Over on the livestock side of things, we are seeing the cash cattle market being the leader there. Uh, definitely woke up. The cash trade was averaging $183 a hundredweight for the year, and that's where the market kind of seemed to level off here a while ago with the board carrying deep discounts, uh, concerned about another fourth quarter drop-off like last year. You know, of course, recession talk was all the rage, but ever since that interest rate cut that occurred from the Federal Reserve, everybody's thinking this soft landing has kind of went away from a recession uh, as they're concerning themselves with the job numbers, that the board has seemed to have been eroding discounts. You could look go of the day the Federal Reserve two weeks ago cut rates, you can look at the cattle board and they've been improving since then. Cash cattle trade quiet here this morning as well. You're listening to the Red River Farm Network. Getting your start in farming is a big lift requiring a lot of resources. The new Starting Gate program from Egg Country Farm Credit Services is here for you. Starting Gate offers preferential rates and custom financing, discounts on financial services, scholarships, and educational opportunities. To learn how Starting Gate can help you, contact your local Egg Country office. Egg Country, focused on egg, focused on you. To some, the sound of a bag of seed being opened marks a year of unpredictability and sleepless nights. But for those opening a bag of Pioneer brand corn, it brings a different set of feelings. To them, that sound marks innovation, knowing every seed has been proven in the toughest environment possible, the field. It marks the start of the best year you'll ever have. Pioneer brand corn hybrids, field proven and ready for yours. Visit Pioneer.com. 1270. Welcome back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270, you're tuned to Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Bach, along with Deidre from Bismarck Transit and Mike Conley, Bismarck City Commissioner. And we're talking about the funding, the mechanism by which transit and paratransit are tied and uh, why public transportation is so important in a community that's growing. And uh, I want to shift gears now to Commissioner Conley because uh, you've come up with this plan to with the growing costs of transit uh you've come up with this plan to kind of manage some of that now i'm going to throw in the caveat that if measure four passes from a property tax perspective that could change the dynamic of what's going on with transit and paratransit in our community and you've got a plan well, I would say it's not you've got a plan or not that I have a plan. Um, this has been an ongoing thing, and there's been several people, a lot of moving parts that 
have um, gone. So if I can back up in history a little bit, in 2022, before I even knew about being appointed to the city commission, before I even was reelected, um, I started attending transit meetings um, with the public transportation element because my field is working with grandmas and grandpas and people with disabilities. And there were concerns out there to where there were some deficiencies within our community and there were, it was hurting families. So as I learned about it, transit was actually going through, um, they had a consultant in trying to navigate some of their challenges and there was a significant funding shortfall that was going, there were some pros and cons that were going in it and it became very apparent that we were not going to bridge that gap um, through the normal channels that were just spoken about. So I started listening to uh, more meetings and talking with more people. And then once I was appointed and it became my portfolio, uh, individual members from the communities of both Mandan and Bismarck started coming to me and they said, what are we going to do if we lose our ride? And that's where the conversation really began is it became about protecting the ride because we couldn't um, keep it in the conversation about saving transit. And um, me, I listen to a lot of the meetings on all government levels in the communities. And that's when um, being part of initiated process, uh, initiated measure processes in the past, I started talking to the user groups. Let's create a conversation. What would it look like if we developed an initiated measure that would cover the spread um, as far as shortfalls that transit was having, but also let's talk about public transportation and protecting the ride in a fiscally responsible way. And that's where the origins of Measure 1 came about. Um, to go on with that, there's a learning curve with that. There was a learning curve when I first became involved in them. Um, you were part of one of those efforts back, uh, mm -hmm. five years ago. Um, and just to get one to come to fruition, you need to establish a subcommittee. And those were members of the user group and community members that may use it in the future. Um, with the transportation system being part of the Metropolitan Planning Organization, so it's multi-jurisdictional, we were looking at two measures, not only the one in Bismarck that's on the November ballot, but we also had one in Mandan that passed by 60%. Um, so they can cover their own public transportation needs um, and actually pay for their services, which Bismarck has been subsidizing since 1987. So they can take care of their own. Now we're focusing on Bismarck. And um, how? what's the details with it is, is that um, we needed 15% of the last mayor's vote election in equivalent of verified electoral signatures. That was 1,466. And there was a miscommunication. Um, we actually uh, had 1,570, but turned in significantly more of that to uh, just earn the right to have the black ink printed on the white paper in November. And what it would be is public transportation, uh, they don't need a full half cent, but that's on these measures, you have to look at half cent incrementals. Um, two tenths of a cent is enough to cover the spread and create the conversation of all these needs we've been talking about. And it doesn't pass on its loan. It's a small part uh, alone. It's a small part of the population that uses the services that may need the services in the future. So we'll meet that need. We are a very pro-public safety community in our area, um, in the MPO. So three-tenths of a cent that normally goes to property taxes, we can change that from a property tax designation to a sales tax designation. In Bismarck, it's been an eight-year conversation. We've outgrown the size of our police station that was established in 1979. Our community is a lot bigger since then. So three-tenths of a cent can go to the building of stations, police or fire. Um, Silver Ranch, um, the expansion out that way, there's a fire station going to go up there. We moved reserve funds around to make room for that. It would be nice to leave that money right where it's at and maintain the uh, tax levels flatter for longer if necessary. Um, the acquisition of police or fire vehicles will always be a need. Um, those are costs incurred by the citizens for their safety. And then the administrative costs at the combined jail. 
Um, we have a lot of people coming from outside our community, breaking our laws, making our community more challenging. They don't buy property, but the property tax owners are covering their expenses. In this way, anything that they purchase, it helps contribute to us addressing the challenges that they bring. So measure one, the various components are basically public safety. Mm -hmm. So three-tenths to the public safety side, two-tenths to the public transportation side, and that makes up the half-cent tax. So uh, we've got about a minute and a half elevator pitch on why people should vote for this. Well, it covers a lot of different, there's a lot of moving parts. And we took into consideration public transportation, it's significant. Um, And but it's a very hard conversation for most people because they can't relate to it. And then all of a sudden they need it. I know somebody that's very, very conservative that broke his back at one point. And he, all of a sudden he said, this is the way I was able to maintain my job. This is the way I stayed connected. Uh, but normally, he was that person on the outside looking in that would not um, vote for something like this. And we're changing the conversation about protecting the ride itself because now we can look at vouchers for taxi. We can look at maybe ideas that we haven't heard about yet. I know there's a significant amount of people that need rides to the airport at 530 in the morning, and Uber and Lyft have not been available, and they've, it's created some heartburn. These are conversations that we can now have if this passes. Okay, Mike Conley, uh, Deidre, thanks for coming in. Uh, measure one on the ballot uh, for the city side of things on uh, whether or not Bismarck um, passes that. Then, uh, Deidre, does that alleviate long term short term what what are you seeing as an administrator with bisman transit yeah so obviously it's a public transit measure so that doesn't mean the money's just going to be handed to us um there would be a com- competitive component and also some oversight from the city um on how those funds are being used but it would 100 percent um make our system a lot more sustainable without these horrible conversations of where we need to cut things. Ongoing conversations. Ongoing, horrible conversations. <laughs> the, the headache of my job. Time. <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, guys, thanks for coming in today. Uh, this is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Talk of the Town, weekday morning starting at 9 on Super Talk 1270 and the free Super Talk 1270 mobile app. tax pros leave a message it's jane i'm moving on to a turbo tax expert who beat your price adam divine tell him how i feel hey, tax pro she's been thinking twice let's believe turbo tax will beat your price this is a tax break. Uh. switch to a turbo tax live expert and we'll beat what you paid your pro last tax season make the switch at turbotax.com slash beat your price turbo tax full service only sign up by 12 20 2024 and file by 4 1 2025 full details at turbotax.com slash beat your price